Hello and welcome to the webinar on Management to Reduce M2O Emissions in Organic Vegetable Production Systems by Anne-Marie Fortuna of North Dakota State University and Doug Collins of Washington State University, Piala. This is the second of two webinars this week on the topic of greenhouse gases and reduced tillage in organic farming systems. The recording of Tuesday's webinar, Why the Concern About Nitrous Oxide Emissions, is now already available on our website and on the eOrganic YouTube channel. My name is Alice Formiga, and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the Organic Agriculture Community of Practice with eExtension. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. We're very glad to be hosting Anne-Marie Fortuna and Douglas Collins today. Um, Doug Collins is an extension faculty with WSU and his extension programs and research focus on soil quality and fruit and vegetable production for small farms. Doug has a PhD in soil science from Washington State University and an MS in plant pathology from Montana State University. Anne-Marie Fortuna is an assistant professor of soil health at North Dakota State University. Her research interests include the microbial and soil processes regulating nutrient cycling, soil health, and global climate change in agriculture and grassland systems. Craig Cogger of WSU, who presented our last webinar on Tuesday on this topic, will be online with us today as well for the question and answer session. So um, with that, I'm going to um, pass on the control of the screen to our first speaker, Doug Collins of WSU. So Doug, you should now have the screen control. OK, thanks, Alice. Let me uh, thank eOrganic for this opportunity. And I also want to recognize Western SARE and the USDA um, Organic Transitions Project for um, the funding to support this research. So the presentation this morning will be split. Muted. First, I'll, I'll begin um, <clears throat> talking about the history and development of organic farming systems research in Western Washington. A review of our sampling strategy for trace gases, including carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide, and then a little bit of uh, preliminary um, flux data and, and where we're going with our uh, analysis of the trace gas flux. And then in part two, Anne Marie will talk about understanding the fundamental processes that drive the release of nitrogen from organic sources, identifying and quantifying key microbial community members that control nitrification and denitrification in different organic farming systems, and linking best management practices to soil quality and the microbiology underpinning carbon and nitrogen cycling. So for our um, gas studies, we're using two different uh, studies. One is what we call the long-term organic farming systems experiment. And these are both at WSU Puyallup. And you can see they're, they're very close in proximity to each other. The other is the reduced tillage organic agriculture experiment. And the long-term organic farming systems experiment was initiated in 2003. And I'll talk a little bit about the um, different rotational systems that we have. But uh, one thing that I like about this um, satellite image is you can see we have a pasture as one of our rotations. So at the time that this study was taken, you can see where the pasture plots are. Um, there's four, uh, four replications. So in each of these replications, there's one um, pasture rotation. And as you'll see, we also uh, have chicken tractors. And I think with the novels of uh, satellite imagery, we can see one of our chicken tractors there. And then with the reduced um, tillage, we also have four replications. Those are, I outlined them in color here. So that's one, two, three, and four. And then we have some practice ground where we um, continue to work on reduced tillage agriculture. And we are in um, western Washington, uh, the wet side of the mountains, as we like to say. So we have a maritime climate with most of our um, moisture coming during the November to April period, and then dry summers. And the design of the projects um, was we, we took into uh, account um, conversations with local farmers and, and looking at what they were doing, specifically, I'd say, with the systems project that was started in 2003. So we had listening sessions and surveys and many visits to small farms, finding out what they were interested in. Um, other surveys have also shown soil qualities and uh, a huge interest to um, organic farmers and other farmers in Washington state. So looking at soil quality really does drive the project. and um, and cover crops, how can farmers get cover crops uh, into their systems. So 
we, we definitely took into account what, what farmers were doing in, in designing um, that study and then also with the reduced tillage the interest in soil quality has, has really driven that among, among farmers and you'll see how we um, integrate uh, farmers in that study as well. I also want to just put in a plug for um, the importance of long-term studies. So this kind of outlines a little bit of what we do with the, redu with the um, organic farming system study where our, our three main treatments are different types of cover crop rotation. And so we have uh, what I'm showing here would be the equivalent of a three-year rotation in each of these circles. So in the pasture, we're in a cash crop for one year and then in um, pasture for two years. In the post-harvest, we um, have cash crop, cover crop, uh, winter cover crop, cash crop, winter cover crop. And it's similar in the relay, but what's different with the relay is we reduce the frequency of tillage. So the little animated tractors here represent where tillage events happen. And so you can see with the relay, uh, we plant the cover, we till, plant the cover crop, and then we don't till before planting the relay cover crop. Um, so that we eliminate a fall tillage here. In the post-harvest, we have tillage between every crop and, and cover crop. And then in the lay, um, there's the least frequency of tillage, and there's a long period with no tillage. So there is no what we would call a no-till vegetable system in here, but there is a difference in the frequency of tillage. And just to review, again, those three cover crop treatments are the relay, which is um, a legume planted into a cash crop sort of in the um, middle of the summer. And then when that cash crop is harvested and removed, the cover crop has a chance to um, grow. The, what most people do would be this post-harvest um, cereal and legume. So the cash crop is harvested and then tillage and the post-harvest cover crop planted. And then the lay is the um, pasture phase. And with the lay, we, as I mentioned, are grazing um, both uh, chicken tractors from meat birds and um, sheep as well. So sheep first and then um, chickens coming in after a short break. And we just, we move these um, across those replications. Uh, so we graze a whole rep at a time. Another element of the study is um, amendment application. So we have two different amendments, uh, chicken manure compost, which we call our low carbon application, and then what we call a mixed on-farm compost, which has a, a higher um, carbon to nitrogen ratio. And so the uh, more, more of the on-farm compost is applied at each time, eight, 8 to 17 dry tons per acre versus the, the lower chicken manure compost application. And we do try to match them in terms of nitrogen availability. And this is the only um, added amendment. We don't add uh, fertilizers uh, to any of the treatments. And then the, the lay is, is not getting any of the amendments added to it at all, just um, what comes from the animal manure and the cover crops. In terms of our gas analyses, this is what we're um, doing with the systems plots. So we focus our gas analyses around events. Uh, you can see um, amendment application and, and, of course, incorporation of that amendment is a, is a big event. So we have a, um, a day before that happens, and then we follow for about two weeks after that happens. Um, uh, with the dry summers that we have, irrigation is important and, of course, has an influence on um, uh, nitrous oxide emissions. So we look at pre-irrigation events and then um, post-irrigation days one and two, and then also the fall uh, incorporation of um, cash crop residue and pre-tillage um, pre before planting cover crops. And then we did two freeze-thaw events this um, fall and winter. And so over the um, 11 years of the systems project, we've been focusing, as I mentioned, on soil quality. Um, a host of uh, different parameters are measured. I wanted to just, just to give a glimpse of some of the changes that have occurred um, through this system um, by looking at infiltration and also some of the nematode um, soil food web data. So here's an infiltrometer. We just do a basic, uh, very simple um, falling water uh, infilt infiltration test to, um, to assess infiltration. And we've seen uh, uh, an effect of the different compost. So again, um, a lot more carbon being added in the on-farm compost uh, treatment. 
and that has um, over time increased infiltration and that's been a pretty steady effect so um, faster infiltration rates for, um, for most years with the on-farm compost. And nematodes um, provide, these are free living nematodes that we're analyzing um, and they provide a great lens into the soil food web um, because they're so diverse. So we have bacterial feeding nematodes which, um, you know, this is just one sort of microscope picture in the, and in, in this slide sort of represents a lot of what's going on in most nematode communities. Bacterial nematodes kind of are most of what we find and then there are some of these large um, predator nematodes which give us an idea of how stable the system is. And then also we have um, different bacterial feeding nematodes and fungal feeding nematodes. And so one thing that we can see by looking, for example, at the ratio of fungal feeding nematodes to bacterial feeding nematodes um, tells us a little bit about what's happening in the microbial community. And we call that the channel index. And so a higher channel index indicates more fungal feeding nematodes relative to bacterial feeding nematodes. And I show this slide just to show that with the um, uh, type of amendment, um, we see, you know, some difference, not statistical, in the, um, in the two carbon treatments. Um, you know, here showing that the chicken manure compost elevating the um, fungal, the channel index a bit. But what is really um, stark is what happens when we're in the pasture phase. We see a, a big difference in the soil microbial community there with a, a major shift to, to more fungal feeding nematodes present. So in this was, these samples were taken during a pasture uh, part of the phase. And this really piqued our interest in terms of the effect of disturbance and, and tillage on um, the soil community. And again, these are just nematodes. Um, Anne-Marie will show some, some evidence of um, differences that are occurring in the uh, bacterial community within the different types of amendments. And so to sort of transition into the reduced tillage project and, and what we're doing and why we're doing that, um, we know tillage is important in terms of managing residues, managing weeds, preparing the seed bed for planting, um, aeration, modifying moisture and temperature. Um, you know, this is, uh, farmers are, are interested in getting the soils dried out in the spring. We have a, we get a lot of rain in the winter and, and we do have wet springs. And so it's um, getting that soil worked up to sort of help in some instances to, to um, help the soil dry out, but of course there's the risk of, of getting in there too early and doing some real damage with um, tillage. But then also when you expose that soil, you're, you're likely to get uh, warmer, warmer temperatures, which with a, a shorter growing season, northern climates, um, that's an important thing to think about. But reducing tillage, on the other hand, we can see decreases in soil compaction. I mean, again, I think that would be a long-term effect of reduced tillage. Um, we don't necessarily see that in the short term. Um, decreasing erosion, surface crusting, decreases in dust, of course, sediment, um, fuel use, and greenhouse gases. And then an increase in uh, soil organic matter, changes in the soil um, community, soil structure and aggregate stability. Again, I think those are probably going to be longer term changes with reduced tillage. Uh, water holding capacity, water infiltration, um, potential for increased carbon sequestration and field access. Um, but is this profitable and doable is, is a question as well. Um, our progress in reduced tillage research in organic production, we began in uh, the summer of 2009, um, we had a farmer that had planted a, a nice cereal rye, just a common rye in 2008. So we got in there with a roller crimper and did some, just a comparison side by side of tilled and no-tilled. And then we started doing some research on our um, station at WSU Puyallup and um, also did an experiment at WSU Mount Vernon. And one thing that um, we, could tell right away from, from talking with other researchers around the country and just in terms of how this would work, cover crops are, are integral to making this work. And as you know, the cover crops aren't going to fare necessarily the same in different climates. So we, we did some pretty uh, intensive cover crop testing. So um, between 2011 and 2012, we looked at 19 different mixes of um, 19 different varieties and mixes, barley, rye, oats, vetch, peas, and triticale. And then we did another um, sort of repeating that again in 2012, um, looking at uh, 16 varieties and mixes 
um, rye, barley, and vetch, and then also at the same time looking at different um, ground preparation strategies, which I'll, I'll get to. Um, but a big focus has been looking at the varieties and how they perform, and then also how we're able to um, terminate them organically. And the, the main focus of ter uh, terminating them organically has been to comparing flail mowing and using the roller crimper. So here you can see um, either some rye or barley being um, uh, terminated with the um, roller crimper on the right and the flail mower on the left. Uh, an important part also of our research there has been looking at the phenology and, and the timing of doing this termination. So we had an experiment where we looked at the early termination, which we call, uh, which we defined for our, our purposes as late anthesis versus um, early milk. So when the crop's a little bit further along, we had a master's student, Sandra Wayman, who um, did this work and is um, working on uh, getting that out there. Her master's or her thesis is completed. And then um, also with the vetch, looking at the stages of development there. So uh, we followed the Michler um, protocol for uh, analyzing vetch progression and looked at early and late, which we called 60% flowering, 100% flowering with vetch development. And just to, uh, throw that out there in terms of vetch, we have we tried rolling it um, one year um, at different stages, at these two different stages, and did not did not work for us at all with a roller crimper to, to get an acceptable termination of vetch. So most of our vetch work or all of our vetch work since then has involved um, flail mowing and we've had we've had great success in, in terminating the vetch with a flail mower at, at the right time. So once the cover crop is down, we look at how, how are we going to get a uh, either a transplant or a seed into that soil. Um, this is what we call our no-till uh, planting aid. And it's a pretty um, simple operation that we've developed here. And it's just a, a, a shank followed um, following a, a coulter, so a coulter cutting a strip, and then uh, just a simple two inch by about four inch wide um, shank in there. We often put some weight on it to get it a little bit deeper, um, trying to get about four or six inches deep with that um, with that furrow there. And so this is, I, I'll show another um, element that's also part of the study, but in terms of our gas analysis, this is what we are looking at when we compare the till versus the no-till. So this would be our no-till um, or our reduced till. The other um, reduced till mechanism we're looking at for, pre for preparing the soil is um, an off-the-shelf um, strip tiller. And this is a ground-driven unit um, made by Yetter. It's called a Yetter Strip Builder. And so one of the things we found, um, just to look at a little bit of the results from our uh, reduced tillage study, is that bulk density does tend to be greater in uh, reduced till plots. So tillage, you know, when we say it prepares the ground for transplants or plants, um, for seeds, it does loosen the soil up, at least in the short term. And we've, we've been able to see that with uh, bulk density analysis. So, so lower bulk density in tilled soils and um, a little bit more uh, higher, higher bulk densities in the reduced tillage plots. We've also been monitoring um, temperature and moisture uh, with, with sensors. And uh, not surprisingly, soil temperature is greater in the full till plots. Um, the flails a little bit, you know, probably not much difference there between the flail and roller crimper, um, a little bit, a little bit difference. But you can see definitely um, five degrees uh, Fahrenheit difference um, on, a, on a sunny day between the um, mean temperature of the um, full till and the flail till, and this is at 10 centimeters. And moisture is a pretty interesting story. We do get, um, you know, where moisture, uh, soil moisture is less where we've, where we've tilled, um, which may be a good thing early in the season, but then we have, uh, as I mentioned, this maritime climate, so it's very dry in the summer. So if there's an argument to, to say that having that moisture in, in the middle of the summer could be a good thing. So we, we do see um, you know, that mulch effect uh, keeping uh, soil moisture higher in the reduced tillage plots. And how this will affect uh, gas emissions is something that we're obviously investigating. And one thing um, 
that were so uh, this is our um, and, and Craig Craig mentioned this last week or, or or touched on how we were doing the gas analysis. We're using static chambers. Um, in addition to taking gas samples and then analyzing them with a gas chromatograph. So for that analysis, we do a zero, 15, and 30 minute um, extraction of gas from the from the chamber. But in addition to that, for carbon dioxide, we're also using an infrared gas analyzer. And that's shown here on the right uh, with our graduate student, Bethany Walters. And what we're doing there is we uh, are able to get a reading much more quickly. So over a period of two minutes, we um, have a, a what's called a dynamic closed cell chamber. And so um, we're using basically the exact same chamber that we're using with the gas chromatograph, but we are able to um, get a reading more, more quickly. So we, t we um, are close the chamber for a period of two minutes to get that um, flux reading. But of course, it only works for carbon dioxide. But one of the things we're interested in is comparing the results between the ERGA and the gas chromatograph. And this is our um, schedule for um, the gas chromatograph and ERGA samples. So again, it's around tillage, around events. So we have tillage, irrigation, and then the fall incorporation. And one thing to point out, and, and I'll show some results from 2012 that also sort of get at this. So where it takes 30 minutes to take a gas chromatograph reading, so we, we try to get that reading immediately after tillage. And then at the same time, we are getting ERGA readings at 1 minute, 5 minute, 10 minute, 15 minute, 20 minute, 30 minutes, and then coming back at one and a half hours and five hours later. So uh, there's a reduced cost and reduced um, labor in order to get these ERGA samples so we can get them a little more intensively. And then we just follow basically the same um, after that as we do with the GC. And in 2012, um, so this shows the this top graph kind of just shows the whole uh, season. We weren't doing it necessarily on events as much. We just did tillage and then kind of followed about every two weeks in 2012. And then here, this shows the minutes after application. And so the, um, the tilled versus adjacent, remember with the planting aid, it's just going right up the middle of the field. So that would be the tilled planting aid, which would be this uh, dark blue line here. And then this right next to it with the planting aid would represent, you know, what 90, 95% of the rest of the um, land surface looks like since you're only disturbing a very small amount um, with that. So, but this one does capture what's happening in that disturbed area. And then um, we do the same sort of setup, although both of these were tilled um, with, the, with the tilled. And then just following those along throughout the season. So again, this this dotted line here would represent what's happening. And this is only CO2 data because that's what our ERGA is capable of. And then for nitrous oxide, I just want to mention um, the work that Bethany is doing right now. So she's calculating fluxes from uh, 2013. She's using the R package HMR, which um, tries to fit a nonlinear um, model, the Hutchinson and Mosier model, um, for estimating the initial flux and compares that to a linear um, calculation. And the package was um, developed by Peterson et al. in 2010. And I would also uh, recommend a paper by um, Rodney Venturia in 2013. And uh, he gave a talk at the Soil Science Society of America meeting, which is also great in, in discussing the importance of looking at nonlinear models for um, estimating initial flux. So the, the package uh, will try to, will um, basically say which, which one is the, is the more likely fit. Sometimes that's going to be the um, HMR model. Um, sometimes it's going to be the linear model. So in this instance, um, over the 30 minutes, the flux was better, fit, better described by the um, linear model. And then just in closing, um, all this uh, reduced tillage organic work, is, is it ever going to go anywhere? Well, we're um, continuing to work closely with farmers, and we've done um, on-farm trials every year since about 2000, well, since about 2008 or 9, as I mentioned. And um, this is a, a farm in western Washington as well, Let Us Farm, and um, doing some work there with Steve, so getting, getting our equipment onto his tractor, um, getting, getting this equipment into the uh, farmer's hands has been great. Um, the results, uh, at least on Steve's farm, have not been great. Um, so while there are problems with it, of course we have a lot of residue, dealing with that residue is an issue. Um, we've, we've only taken the strip tiller out there, but 
you know, we get a lot of residue caught up inside of the um, implement, um, having to stop and, and pull that out. So um, still some, some work to be done there. Um, at Steve's place, he's got a, uh, a silt loam soil, so a little heavier than the fine sandy loam that we have in Puyallup and heavier than another farm that we're working with. And we've seen um, not good results at all in terms of yield. Uh, so this was from 2012, a lot better uh, squash yields in his using his sort of conventional tillage. Um, on the bright side, um, at Kearsop Farm, where they have a sand or, or loamy sand soil, um, and actually for this experiment we used vetch, um, and, and so there was no rolling crimping, but we did vetch and then tilled it, um, and then prepared the ground with strip tillage. And we saw great results with both broccoli and kale in terms of using the reduced tillage. So much different soil type, um, different results, but this uh, no-till into, into vetch is, is got us, I'm very excited. And that's uh, just an example of what that looks like. Um, this is about 21 days after uh, terminating a beautiful vetch crop and then getting the um, cash crop planted there um, very quickly. And I believe that's my last slide. Unmuted. Okay, Anne Marie, okay. I'm going to give you. Thank you John. This is. Okay, sorry about that. I'm just going to give Anne Marie the control of the screen here. Okay, you should have it now, Anne Marie. Super. Did you want to say anything else, Alice, before I start? No, that's it. <laughs> okay. So that was a great overview of uh, the Puyallup site. I just want to emphasize that uh, the grant continues some of the work that we've started in the past. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today Muted. relates to, um, at least in the case of uh, the things that I'm talking about, the nitrogen management that uh, we needed to work out very carefully because in these organic systems, nitrogen is limited. And so we're constantly trying to get our nitrogen out at the right time for plant uptake. And so all of the new information about the reactive nitrogen and its contribution to greenhouse gases, especially the nitrous oxide aspect, um, actually builds on what we did previously. I'd also like to emphasize the fact that we have research sites and then we have farm sites. So some of the things that Doug was talking about was uh, related to direct grower um, implementation of some of these management practices that we're measuring the influence on the nitrous oxide. Um, in addition, there is a set of plots at Purdue that is just beginning, and so in the future we'll have webinars from that site as well. And then now that I'm in North Dakota, we have a long-term no-till plot um, that we have integrated into the uh, systems project as well. So Doug has a transitional no-till plot, and then uh, we're also including a longer-term plot. But today, um, what I'm discussing is just on that main research site. And so periodically, I'll refer back to some of the uh, management practices that Doug talked about previously. So I hope that that provides some synergy between the two talks. So why do microbes matter? Um, you know, obviously, to the grower, the, the things that we're telling them to manage our larger implements. Um, we're working with things that they can see, crops, uh, rotations, and cover crops. But all of uh, those things relate back to the microbial processes. And so nutrient cycling, soil health, and microbial processes provide both the nitrogen for uh, crop growth and also the microorganisms are what in part um, results in our loss of trace gases like nitrous oxide. So um, this part of the research then is going to focus at least my part and my grad student Arnab Bomek on the processes that drive release of nitrogen from organic sources and we'll be identifying and quantifying microbial community members that control nitrification which uh, relates back to mineralization and release of nitrogen and its conversion into nitrate which in turn can be leached or denitrified. I think we spoke a little bit last time when Craig was uh, giving the talk about the fact that the nitrate leaching has been fairly minimal and that our rainfall patterns are such that 
um, the leaching would occur largely in fall and spring and that we have been monitoring um, with deep cores the movement of the nitrate. And so the missing component then is the gaseous losses largely. And so um, we can use some of the biological measures of soil health that we've also used in the past to monitor mineralization and nitrogen availability to look at these processes, nitrification and denitrification, that lead to, uh, to losses. And so some of the biological and chemical indicators that we've been measuring continuously um, for quite some time now, um, since 2007, uh, include things like enzyme activity. So enzyme activity is indicative of how quickly things cycle, and it relates back to the stores of the nitrogen and carbon that our management practices are intended to build. So in all systems, um, much of the nitrogen does come from soil organic matter, but from an organic management systems, we're much more heavily dependent on nitrogen, and that nitrogen um, from organic sources is tied to carbon and is less readily available. So um, growers in organic systems need to be very aware of both the carbon and nitrogen cycle, and all of the management practices that we've been discussing are meant to enhance that release. So the things that Doug talked about with how you flail or turn over your cover crops and at what time you kill. All those things then relate to decomposition, mineralization, and nitrification. And then that in turn determines the pool of plant available nitrogen, which is that reactive pool that these losses are coming from as well. And so we have to draw on that history of information to know over time what the average amount of nitrogen available is, and then we need to monitor the flow of that to determine um, where our losses are. And so uh, chemical components like the total carbon and nitrogen are essentially equivalent to a bank of nutrients and how available those nutrients are relates to some of these other parameters like particulate organic matter. So that's the nitrogen and the carbon that's organically bound that the organisms can mineralize quickly and that would go through the nitrification and potentially denitrification processes. And then finally, looking at the actual microbial communities, both their activity and their size and structure is also useful and I'll go into detail in the next few slides about why that's the case. So uh, focusing on nitrifiers because we have a lot more data in that area because um, we started out with monitoring um, things that were not directly related to trace gases. I'll use that as an example. So as we've increased the soil quality in these long-term plots in Puyallup, we found that with the increases in soil organic matter and mineralizable nitrogen, that we also have changes in the nitrifier populations. So the amount of nitrifiers that the soil can uh, support has changed over time and increased as the fertility levels have increased. And then the rates of these organisms in turn have also increased. And so that relates uh, to some of the plant available nitrogen aspects. And then as we look at trace gases, we can uh, look at the relationship between their increase in activity and the fluxes that we're measuring as nitrous oxide. So we have a set of field um, based measurements that allow us to get a better handle of the in situ uh, events, but then we also have a set of laboratory experiments where we can carefully trace nitrogen um, from different pools and different organisms and try to determine where our nitrous oxide is coming from, nitrification, denitrification, or both, it's usually both. And that's relevant because we can then in turn correlate that hopefully with the management and in situ measurements. So when we have certain types of events like we talked about previously, irrigation, tillage, um, how does that affect the rates of these organisms and how much nitrous oxide they produce. And then the environmental conditions come into play there too. So really these communities of organisms, um, nitrifiers in, um, in the future uh, will be correlating with denitrifiers as well, can reflect your long-term management because we said as the soil organic matter builds up, the community numbers build up and potentially the rates could shift as well. And then we also see the rates and less often the copy numbers or the 
the cell numbers, the biomass, for, it's um, not a direct biomass measurement, but it's a decent proxy, can fluctuate with our inputs of cover crops and compost and manures. And the types of organic nitrogen and carbon in those manures um, uh, have an influence on the rate of the transformation of the nitrogen through the organisms themselves. So although the biology shifts, um, it shifts in a way that m typically is consistent um, over, over time. So then I guess the next question um, that maybe a lot of you are having is, well, if it's in a farming system and denitrification is an anaerobic process, how can you have denitrification and nitrification in the same space? So a lot of that relates back to management too. Um, Doug was talking about how if you have covers or if you're tilling that you have more or less soil moisture, more or less carbon available or in um, the vicinity of the organisms that are nitrifying or denitrifying. So in a small aggregate, if you take the example of a clod with a root growing through it, the root may be going through a pore that is essentially not contiguous, so it's, it's a closed system there. And inside that pore, there's that carbon source and nitrogen in that root, and then there's organisms that are decomposing the root. Um, carbon, and they are releasing ammonium. So that's mineralization, and they're using up oxygen. So once the ammonium is available, the nitrifying organisms can uh, nitrify, and they'll use up more of the oxygen because they need oxygen. They're aerobic, and they don't use the organic carbon. They use some of the CO2 in the soil atmosphere as a carbon source, and then the ammonium as energy and convert it to nitrate. So after a time, as the oxygen levels drop, there's maybe denitrifiers in that same space, and they'll take the nitrate from the nitrification process. And if they have enough nitrate and enough organic carbon, because most of them are heterotrophs, that means they use organic carbon to build cells. And if the oxygen is low enough, they can convert nitrate to elemental nitrogen, which is not a trace gas, and it's an inert um, uh, gas that makes up the majority of our atmosphere. But typically in soil systems, something is limiting nitrate, carbon, or there's 1% oxygen or so. And so they're not as efficient at converting the nitrate into elemental nitrogen, and they produce a lot of nitrous oxide. So that's how, in the same tiny space, you can get both processes occurring at the same time. Now, I'd also like to mention, and I don't want to be too confusing, that some denitrifiers also lack an enzyme to convert nitrate all the way to elemental nitrogen. But typically, the nitrous oxide production is related more to a shortage of one of the inputs, like the nitrate or the carbon. So that means then in our soil system that all these management practices that we're superimposing in the climate and the irrigation are mixing together to create these environments where we're selecting for or against these different communities of organisms. So typically, um, in ag systems anyway, we have enough nitrifiers and denitrifiers that the actual biomass of the organisms is sufficient for both of these processes to occur. Um, so that's usually not a problem. But if you have very large inputs of ammonium, sometimes you can have a delay in nitrification. Uh, so the things more that are the drivers, though, are related to water filled pore space, and that in turn controls uh, levels of oxygen. And so, um, again, uh, where you bury your residues, how much residue you have, how quickly those residues mineralize, all influence oxygen, and then tillage and bulk density also in turn relate to um, movement of water and the amount of water filled pore space. So uh, we're looking at how tillage in particular can influence these types of factors and we're conducting experiments in the field and in the laboratory at different water contents with different bulk densities in long term um, no-till uh, fields. And so it'll be interesting to see how some of these factors relate to um, the communities that are present and how quickly they transform the reactive nitrogen to nitrous oxide. Uh, so that's in the future. Uh, we're currently conducting the incubations and experiments. And so then overall, um, 
the denitrifier populations tend to be more resilient. And uh, as Doug and Craig both said, we've been monitoring uh, trace gases, nitrous oxide uh, in this instance, uh, throughout the growing season and in the winter. Um, we don't know a whole lot about the effect of freeze-thaw events on release of nitrous oxide. And so it would be interesting to see, and we'll find out, which communities are most active when. And uh, denitrifiers specifically tend to be a bit more hardy and resilient. They resist drops in temperature, increases in salinity, and are less sensitive to pH. So we're expecting uh, to see a difference in these types of factors. Um, as we measure both the flux of nitrous oxide in the community structure um, in the freeze-thaw cycles. So we have a set of in-situ gas samples and soil samples to look at community structure, and we also have a set of incubations in which we have labeled N15 that we're um, tracing through these uh, organisms. So. Um, to get into the data, this data then uh, represents the pools of potentially mineralizable nitrogen out on the long-term experiment um, in Puyallup. So again, Doug mentioned, uh, and I think he did a good job of describing the different um, amendments and the ways that we handled them. But uh, just to recap, we have two annual systems where we're growing vegetable crops, and those systems are getting animal amendments, uh, one set compost, the other manure. And he, as he mentioned, we try to match the nitrogen rates in those systems. And then we also have cover crop managements. Um, but in addition to the green manure and animal manure, inputs, we also have a bank of nutrients, and I uh, conducted a half a year incubation to estimate those pools of nitrogen, and they were in the range of about 100 milligrams per kilogram of nitrogen um, being made available in the first 71 days of this incubation. So if you correct that for field conditions, I mean, nothing's perfect, uh, that would mean that in about a growing season, you would get approximately 100 milligrams per kilogram just from the soil nitrogen itself. And so there's um, at least half probably of the nitrogen that's coming from these stores. Um, and so this just shows you in this organic system and even in conventional systems that we can't ignore the credit that we're getting from these organic sources. And so all of that is microbially driven um, you know, through mineralization, and all of that nitrogen, for the most part, is going to go through the process of nitrification. So for periods of time in which you have this large release of nitrogen from solar organic matter and these other organic sources, we could have quite a bit of um, nitrous oxide release as a byproduct of nitrification. So these next few slides, we're going to talk about uh, the plant available nitrogen, that reactive nitrogen that is coming out of those organic sources, how it pulses during the growing season, how that relates to this um, rate of nitrification that's controlled by uh, bacterial and archaeal nitrifiers, and then also in turn relate that to the size of the community um, that I measured in these field plots. So the first slide in the sequences, and there's um, two sets of these, is the plant available nitrogen, the reactive nitrogen that we're getting from these, um, the mineralization of these organic um, inputs. And so the blue and the purple bars represent uh, the annual cropping systems. That's the vegetable cropping systems that have both the cover crops and the animal amendments. The green bars relate to the pastures, so that's our perennial system. And you can see, um, I think two things are obvious. One is that the amount of reactive nitrogen in the annual systems is quite high. The pulse is in June, and that's, you know, that's uh, coinciding with the uptake in the vegetable crops. So um, it looks like our nitrogen management out of these organic amendments is, is working well. Um, we have equivalent of 100 milligrams per kilogram of nitrogen, so we're a little, we're always a little bit on the low end. And so that spike then drops dramatically though in September, which is when you know our vegetable crops are um, getting towards the end of uh, the season and we don't really need the nitrogen anymore. So you can see at least that we don't have a lot of excess reactive nitrogen 
out there available for denitrification. Um, the pasture system is very low in nitrogen, but if you compare um, the baseline in June of the pasture with the September samples in the annual crops, you can see that that background pool of nitrogen is fairly constant across the, two, the three managements. So, and then the September pulse in this pasture is related to the senescence of the um, delayed pasture. So there's some die-off even in these um, perennial systems, and of course there are some annual um, plants in, in the lay. So um, one would expect then if you're adding a lot of um, nitrogen to the system in the form of ammonium after the organic material mineralizes, that it would stimulate nitrification. And of course, the nitrification potential, which is um, the activity of the nitrifiers, increases in those two annual systems, the blue and the purple bars, you can see in June. And so um, the rate increases and it doesn't drop. So even after the pool of um, ammonium is used up, the organism's activity and potential to nitrify is still quite high. So, um, you know, I think that's something important to note and that relates then to how productive these organisms can be and in turn, um, hopefully there will be some correlation with the trace gas production, the nitrous oxide from the nitrification potential as we get more information. Now, I've, another interesting um, point, I think, is that if you look at the lay pasture, that there's that small amount of nitrogen, that turnover probably of the um, plant material in September, and that small increment of nitrogen has a dramatic um, influence on the nitrifier populations, so they appear to be very efficient at being able to nitrify. And so you see that, again, that pulse of, of reactive inorganic nitrogen um, is stimulating the population of nitrifiers in the system. So there's a direct link between um, mineralization, nitrification, and then hopefully we'll be able to show um, into the denitrification process. So, and then making the same comparisons in the um, manured systems, not looking at the um, delay, but just the two annual systems that receive the compost and the chicken um, manure, we can see that um, although we're trying to match the nitrogen in these two systems, um, and the uptake is, is uh, somewhat similar, I believe, uh, that the residual nitrogen in the compost um, remains and that it has the potential to provide extra at reactive nitrogen um, and that this reactive nitrogen um, is less in September but it continues through the warm warmer part of the season. So there's more of a pool of that mineralizable nitrogen so it has an influence on plant available nitrogen on the nitrification rates which is this next slide so nitrification potential is greater in that system and so um, we're seeing in the preliminary data that there, that may also relate to um, nitrous oxide production. So there's a difference uh, between the annual and perennial systems and in the compost versus chicken manure. But uh, we don't have all that data currently, so I don't want to touch on that uh, currently. These two tables then are the copy numbers of the nitrifiers. So um, we measure the DNA and um, what we're looking at is a small piece of the genome that codes for an enzyme. And so the enzymes that are allowing this organism uh, to convert the, um, in this instance, ammonium into nitrate. Uh, and there's only one to three copies in the whole um, genome of the organism. So it isn't exactly a, micro, a biomass measurement, but it's close. And so um, if you look at the first set of information at the top, that's the bacterial nitrifiers. So there are nitrifiers that are bacteria and nitrifiers that are archaea. They're both small microorganisms and they both um, have similar enzymes that convert ammonium to nitrate. So if we look at the dates between June and September, um, when we looked at the bar graphs for the active reactive nitrogen and nitrification potential, June was very high in the annual systems and September had dropped. If you look at the numbers of the organisms in uh, the chicken manure and in the compost, uh, they don't vary between 
uh, June and September. So uh, once these organisms are active and um, you know they they grow, they persist for quite a while. So you see there's um, interaction between the inorganic nitrogen, the nitrification potential, and the copy number, but um, there's a lag. Um, I'd also like to point out with the bacteria, if you look um, between the chicken manure and the compost, that there's more of the bacterial ammonia oxidizers in the um, manured site relative to where the compost is applied. And so that may be due to the fact that initially, even though we try to match the nitrogen measurements, that there's more available ammonium in that chicken manure. And so that may allow for um, more growth of the bacterial ammonia, ammonia oxidizers relative to the compost system that um, at least initially can be uh, create a mobilization. If we look at the archaea, um, we see that there's the same copy numbers uh, over the June-September stretch within the season, and then between the two treatments, they're the same, so um, they don't decrease in the compost management. Um, that may be because these organisms are um, using some of the organic carbon, so um, you probably don't remember this, but I mentioned that ammonia oxidizing bacteria use CO2 as a carbon source and ammonium as their energy source. So this shows then um, potentially a different niche for each of these organisms, but that they're both um, they're both transforming um, nitrogen. So from a basic science perspective, that's interesting. Um, from the grower perspective, it could relate to the rates of transformation. So um, bacteria, ammonia oxidizers are larger and they transform more ammonium um, per cell than the archaea. So even though their copy numbers are the same, the rates of transformation are different um, and we know that because we use isotopic labels. That's something that we do in the laboratory. So in the future what we'd like to do is continue this line of work but link it more closely with the trace gases and look to see um, how much then of the, the trace gas comes from this population of microorganisms and just denitrifiers and then link that with our different managements and our different um, events throughout the growing season and different water contents and other um, types of management conditions. So with this data, we, I think we can say um, that nitrification potential in organic systems is a good indicator of the fertility of the system. Um, it's an indicator of increases in soil quality or could potentially be for decreases in soil quality as well. And it potentially relates to losses of reactive nitrogen. And I also want to emphasize that it's important to link some of the basic field research and on uh, farm research with more basic research that we can't um, do specifically in the field and that this type of research can truly lead to increases in nitrogen use efficiency um, and losses, um, prevention of losses in reactive nitrogen um, on a larger farm scale. So I think I really appreciate being involved in this project and having a chance to let um, to lead it um, because I think that those aspects are well addressed and that we have a lot to offer as a group. So I hope that you'll um, tune in to uh, the additional web webinars in the future and that we'll have more both applied and basic research to present in the future. Okay, thanks Anne-Marie. Um, we're about to begin our question and answer period. Here is a question about um, where people can find the results that compared flail and rolling across mixes and varieties. Have you published anywhere that or is that available on a website somewhere? Or Yeah, uh, this is Doug. They've been submitted for publication. So that's, um, I, I suppose you could access Sandra's uh, thesis. Okay. That should be available online. I, I think um, she, so the thesis is done and she's graduated. So I think the thesis is probably um, available, okay. but it's also been submitted. Could you repeat her, her last name as well <laughs> um, so that people could look it up? Uh, yeah. Wayman. Okay. And it sounds like Craig might have a comment too. Um, yeah, we don't have it. We don't have 
kind of her presentation posted on the web at this point, but she has submitted a, a couple of articles um, for publication and you know, given the length of the publication process, it'll probably be, you know, end of the year before those actually hit the streets. Okay. Um, in terms of amendment application, um, what strategies do you use to predict the availability of nitrogen? And um, does the residence time of these amendments impact subsequent application rates? W want me to handle that one, Doug? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, um, we did a project back, oh, it was about 2000, 2001, and this was between WSU and Oregon State University where we um, evaluated a range of amendments. We had both composted and uncomposted amendments. We had dairy manure. We had broiler litter. Um, we had a number of specialty products, we had yard debris, we had rabbit manure, and did both field studies and we grew sweet corn and compared uptake in the sweet corn with uptake from different rates of um, commercial fertilizer. So this obviously wasn't done on certified organic land, although our organic amendments were all of the certified type. And also, um, Dan Sullivan at Oregon State did laboratory incubations, and his graduate student, Eric Gale, um, was really the person doing those and saw a good connection between the two of them. So we published a paper, um, I'm forgetting the title right now, but it's Gale, G-A-L-E, et al., 2006, in the Journal of Environmental Quality that summarizes all of that work. And then as kind of a practical tool, um, the folks at Oregon State, um, Nick Andrews particularly developed the organic fertilizer calculator using that data. Now, one thing that I've noticed is I have a feeling that with our on-farm compost, we may be, and, and we've used those calculations, we may be underestimating how much nitrogen is actually being supplied by our particular material. What we've done over time is, is particularly for that on-farm compost, um, just because of all of the organic matter we were putting into the system, we have reduced those rates. And in Doug's slide, I think you know we had like 8 to 17 um, dry ton per acre applications, and we were up around 16, 17 in the early years and down to about 8 in the later years. Okay, great. I just put the link to the um, fertilizer and cover crop calculators from Oregon State into the chat box for everyone there. Um, and um, my colleague here, um, John, just put in the link to the publication by Eric Gale. So, oh, fantastic! Thanks, thanks I was going to send that, you John. that. Okay. Otherwise. Thanks. Yep. Um, okay. Um, in terms of amendment application. Um, okay, I just asked that one, so let me just... I, I, oh, oh, let me add one oh, more oh, thing. Yeah. I don't mm -hmm. know if you have it, John, or not, but there's also the follow-up, the year two study um, when Cherilot was Dan's graduate student, and that one has been published, and, um, and, and so that one is available as well. Okay, we'll, in, we'll see if we can yeah. <laughs> find that one. Um, okay, um, do you anticipate that organisms present in the amendment composting process persist through application and contribute to soil nitrogen cycling? Okay, um, I, this is Anne-Marie, so I, you probably know that, but <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll start and then um, if Greg wants to say anything or Doug, um, jump in. So typically, uh, there isn't a lot of carryover or persistence, but there's also, especially in these more fertile systems, uh, a large indigenous background of microorganisms that can handle, you know, decomposition, some mineralization, carbon release, and then these transformations that uh, we've been talking about with the nitrification and, um, you know, there's denitrifiers as well. So uh, typically, no, I know that with biodynamic compost, that is one of the concepts behind it. And I think with within a compost pile, while you're carefully managing it, that you can, um, if you're good at making compost, 
select for specific communities and there is this succession of communities as the compost pile heats up and um, I, for sure with the biodynamic they add the poultices but um, I haven't seen any uh, published data that suggests that within that compost pile that what you added in your poultice is what ends up growing up and becoming sort of dominant at the different stages. And then when you apply it to the soil, I think there's just so much microflora in there that it would be hard to get anything to persist. So rhizobiums and mycorrhiza would be an exception perhaps and that if you have a host, you know, that they can persist over time and they have a special relationship with plants, but yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't have anything okay. to add. It's kind of an if you build it, they will come. As far yeah. as you know, w what what is in the compost pile, and then that's going to definitely respond to the, you know, to the conditions in the soil, and it's probably you know the organic matter um, and the quality of that kind of more than the critters in the compost. I think that are going to run the show. Yeah. Like well said. I, th I think Hortank, who is out of Ohio State, um, Alex Storm from Oregon State, worked under him, was able to, um, within a compost pile and within potting media in a, um, in a greenhouse, uh, get some trichoderma and other fungal populations that, um, uh, that are, uh, you know, protect against some pathogens like Rhizoctonia to persist. But once he got into the field setting with, you know, potatoes and things like that, there's just too much indigenous population. Okay. Um, do you have any data comparing N2O emissions from systems with different types of cover crops? Which one of us would you like to take that? Doug, do you want, since you haven't answered anything? Uh, no, I don't have any... Uh... I haven't looked at that specifically. Um, Craig, I, I have some comments, but I'd like to get other people's input. Yeah, go ahead. So, Craig, are you? No. It, it, yeah, I, I, I would say just go ahead, you know. Okay. Um, yeah. So with the cover crops, I think the driver is going to be partly climatic and then um, especially with the mixtures that we've worked with on different projects, um, some of which was on systems and others were plots adjacent to, that it really depends on, um, we've done a lot of legume, uh, small grain mixtures like rye and hairy vetch and so depending on the climate we get variable amounts of hairy vetch and rye and where we get more uh, vetch, we get higher nitrogen content in rye. So if you get quick release from the cover crops at a time where it's still pretty cool and wet and you don't um, have, you know, any type of live cover to take up the N, then it can dramatically increase your nitrous oxide um, emissions because you've got that added carbon that at least the denitrifiers need. Um, so it's all about the timing and the management and how much material you have there and the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So um, it varies somewhat between year and it is something I think that in organic systems we have to think about managing but I think still because the nitrogen is limited um, and we do have this carbon with nitrogen together that um, we can manage it in a way that reduces nitrous oxide emissions relative to say some of these no-till conventional plots that have low CO2 emissions but higher nitrous oxide. And one of the things that I hope we can answer with some of the more basic research is when we have denitrification in these systems, do we have more um, elemental nitrogen as a byproduct and less nitrous oxide from the organic managements or is it favoring this partial conversion and incomplete denitrification that um, that creates more pulses of nitrous oxide. And so I think um, even in conventional systems and drainage ditches and things like that or in water treatment systems we're trying to balance the rate of the carbon and the nitrogen coming out of say the irrigation ditch in a way that pulses or creates denitrification that is complete and um, it will result in uh, 
the, nit the elemental N and not the trace gas nitrous oxide. Okay. Um, are you following up the food web work with nematodes in relation to denitrification potential? Um, we we are we have been taking uh, nematode samples from the reduced till plots, so that <clears throat> the experiment that's looking at reduced tillage. I haven't taken them from um, the systems plot for a couple of years, so. Uh, I think the answer is maybe, or <laughs> there may be some some ability to look at at at, at that with the um, at least with the trace gas and the reduced tillage. But um, it hasn't. I guess we haven't really um, planned that, so we're not necessarily trying to synchronize those the way we are with looking at the microbial communities, where we're really trying to synchronize the trace gas and the soil sampling. <coughs> it's an interesting idea, though. Yeah, I think there's not a direct link. I, I think um, Doug's work and it's published. It's quite good um, with the nematodes, um, and you can just jump in. Doug is more related to the disturbance factor because um, you can't build these communities and in these food webs that are um, very um, intricate if their homes are constantly being um, obliterated. So, and the nematodes are large enough that they just get completely uh, annihilated. Well, I, I mean, the the thing is that the, the nematodes are affected differently. So, um, the bacterial feeding nematodes, you know, their populations may drop temporarily, but they'll they'll respond very quickly along with the bacteria. So there are the, there are some nematodes that are are um, uh, quite adept at, at dealing with disturbance and others that aren't. And so that's kind of the, the nice thing about that analysis is it, it it gives you an indication or a good integrator of what, what the recent practices have been. So following disturbance, you tend to lose those larger nematodes, like the predators and omnivores and also um, fungal feeders, but um, you see an abundance of bacterial feeding nematodes. Hmm. Um, okay. Um Here's a question about, um, in an organic system, should we not have a balanced system of anaerobic and aerobic microbes? So I wouldn't, I'm not sure um, how we would define a balanced system of aerobic or anaerobic microbes, but um, I mean, I guess the idea is that you do want to have um, good infiltration, um, aeration, pore space, so in that sense, um, you know, having management practices that foster that um, should provide a wide range of organisms, a diverse range of organisms. Um, and I think, you know, there's, the, I want to emphasize that the nitrogen cycling organisms are a very small percentage of the total organisms, but they have a key role, and that's one of the reasons why um, we uh, focus on them. So. Of the total bacterial population, you know, uh, nitrifiers are between 0.1 and 1% of the total, and denitrifiers somewhere between maybe 1 and 5%. So um, there aren't, there are some, for sure, some anaerobic microorganisms, but I haven't really seen anything in the literature, and that would be interesting because if you look at, you know, gut rumens and things like that, that um, we talk about as being very balanced systems. They have anaerobic components and all of that. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how you would answer that. Um, maybe, maybe a little bit more information from the person who asked that question would okay. be helpful. Yeah, yeah. Just an, another comment that I would have is, is for agri for most agricultural crops, um, you know, we want the soils to be aerobic because that's what the roots need. And so just that aerobic habitat is going to favor the is going to favor the aerobic organisms. And it's when we're you know and it's when we have our wet periods um, that we can get um, anaerobic conditions or ones that are getting less aerobic and you know getting more a habitat more suitable for some of the anaerobes or the facultative ones. Okay, thank you. Um, Let's see. Um, last question here um, that we have. Um, any studies on earthworms in these systems? 
Yes, um, we have looked at, we started looking at earthworms when we started our reduced tillage uh, work and you know it's kind of an interesting story that I'm still scratching my head on the first, so one of the studies we did was in a different part, you would have still seen it in that map that I showed but it would be south of the systems project where we um, did our first reduced tillage trial and we saw some really great um, data there in terms of the difference between um, earthworms in the reduced tillage plots versus the tilled plots and we did the same kind of thing that we're doing with the gas where we looked in the you know that small d disturbed zone versus the zone outside and we saw even differences between those zones um, and then when we moved the experiment up to the north um, I went out uh, so we it, earthworms are there's a certain time of year where you can get earthworms to come out of the soil and we use the um, isothiocyanate uh, ir skin irritant to get them to come out and they're most active in about April to May we're doing our tillage in um, June generally so it's a kind of an advantage a disadvantage already in order to get them out but I went out last year where we were in um, before tillage in May and really got n almost no earthworms to come out of that part and jumped around the whole area of uh, different treatments not getting uh, any earthworms went back to that area where we were before and there they were just coming out in, in masses so it's a little sandier up there in the uh, in that part um, maybe the soil hasn't been loved as much as the other area over time so I'm not exactly sure why there's just sort of a general low abundance up there but um, in one of our early trials in 2011 yeah we got some we had some good data showing uh, the difference between earthworm populations in the tilled versus no tilled so I think um, we'll try again uh, this year just to, to see again if, if we can find earthworm populations up there but uh, you know that's one of the nice things about nematodes in, ter in terms of a you know they're not they're not ecosystem engineers like earthworms are but I think they're a good indicator of you know the presence of like especially if you see some of those larger nematodes um, predators etc they're kind of a good indicator of, of an environment where you might uh, find more earthworms and they're they're a lot easier to um, work with and sample and, and then was, sorry go ahead well I was just gonna say while I got the mic I was uh, <laughs> um, remiss in not mentioning our uh, organic organic reduced tillage in the Pacific Northwest we have a community of practice um, website with eOrganic and for the person who is looking for cover crop information um, there's some good resources up there. We've had field days and posted our field day uh, notes up there. So that's on the eOrganic webpage. And then you could also send me an email and I could send you a, um, our field day handout from 2013 has some, some good uh, cover crop biomass data. And so, okay, John, great. I was going to ask if you uh, knew approximately the area required to, because the earthworms are much larger than, say, the nematodes um, that would be needed to get a good estimate, because some of our, you know, our systems work is small intentionally to prevent um, for a high uh, variability, and how does that interplay with your um, worm sampling? Yeah, they they are pretty variable. We do um, you know three subsamples in a plot. It's a, like a 12 by 18 inch. We made it um, rectangular so we could kind of straddle that zone of disturbance. So rather than using a square, we we went um, rectangular, and I think it was 12 by 18 inches. And we'd get um, you know pretty pretty good. At least if there were earthworms there, they were we were getting enough to to I think get some statistically significant uh, data. But in contrast with nematodes, you can you can sample across a whole plot, um, composite that soil, and then in the systems plots, for example, from like a third of a cup of soil is about what we use. You can get between 2,000 and 10,000 or 12,000 nematodes. So you get a very good indication of abundance and diversity. Um, whereas with nematodes, it's or with earthworms, yeah, they're they're much um, less abundant. So it's hard to get those good numbers without disturbing a lot of soil. Well, we just put some more links in the chat box here. Um, the um, Dan Sullivan happened to be walking by around here. And so um, the um, part two that Craig mentioned by Dan Sullivan's grad student, um, the link to that is now in your chat box, um, predicting plant available nitrogen from organic amendments in the second year after application. 
And then also um, the link to the um, eOrganic site on the reduced um, tillage project is also in the chat box. So um, for those of you interested in finding out more, um, feel free to check those out. It's organic reduced tillage in the Pacific Northwest. So um, we are now running out of time. So I would like to um, thank everyone um, for your questions and mention once again that you can find um, this and many of our other upcoming and archived webinars on organic farming and research topics at the link on your screen. Thank you very much, um, Craig, Doug, and Anne-Marie for this series of webinars. And we look forward to um, learning more about this project um, in the future. So thank you very much. And thanks to everyone for joining us today.